Hi, welcome to the King's Woman channel. I'm your host, Mercy Simpson. In this video, I share a message mainly to those in eldership and leadership position in the body of Christ. It's a call to consecrate before we get ready to shift into the kingdom gear. Just a disclaimer, this message does not come to me easily, so if you assume that I speak from a place of strength, power, glory, or wealth, it is not even close to the truth. Also, if you may find that it comes across strong, then this message is not for you. In 2017, I sensed in my spirit a message that gradually matured over the years. During the corona pandemic years, I was gripped by what was happening in the spirit realm. I wrestled with this message intensively for the last two years, but felt it was not the time to deliver. The message was just one word, consecrate. Let's go all the way back to history in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 to the reign of King Uzziah. Verse 5 says, He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Verse 15 says, His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. Uzziah defeated his hostile enemies, rebuilt cities and towns, strengthened his capital and country, had a powerful military with skillfully designed war machines and weapons. He exercised his royal authority and power in the affairs of his state wisely. God gave him success. Verse 16 says, But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led him to his downfall. Uzziah crossed a boundary when he tried to exercise his royal authority in the temple of the Lord as well, and thus he became unfaithful to the Lord his God. Azariah the priest at that time together with 80 other courageous priests, confronted him. Uzziah became angry, and while he was raging at the priests at the incense altar in the temple of the Lord, leprosy broke out on him, and that was the end of Uzziah's public life. Verse 21 says that he lived and died in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. But unlike him, he did not enter the temple of the Lord. Jotham saw what happened to his father, and he kept away from the temple. Jotham's son Ahaz succeeded to the throne, and during his reign, he shut down the entire temple. Ahaz's son Hezekiah succeeded to the throne, and he reopened the temple doors. He brought back the priests and Levites and said, Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord. Remove all defilement from the temple. Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil and God forsook them. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling and turned their backs on Him. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that His fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. This is from Second Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 to 11. What does it even mean to consecrate? It means to set aside someone or something for the use of a sacred purpose. It means to separate oneself from the norm and to dedicate or devote oneself to something that is beyond the norm. Consecration is an act of dedication, to sanctify, to make holy, to be set apart as sacred. To stand before the Most Holy One and to serve Him requires His servants to be holy. It requires them to be separated from this world and its affairs and be set apart for the bidding of the Holy One. Why was there a need to call the priests to consecrate? And how did the temple of the Lord got defiled? History tells that Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, was an evil man. He did not honor God or fear him. 
He did detestable things, copying the ways of the nations around him and promoted wickedness in Judah. He was most unfaithful to the Lord. He rearranged the temple of the Lord, built high places in every street corner to burn sacrifices to other gods. He shut down the doors of the temple of the Lord and provoked God to anger. God sent the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, and Micah to be his voice to his people. But Ahaz did not listen to them. One time during his reign, the army of Aram camped in Israel and together they schemed to attack Judah. Ahaz and his people heard about this and the Bible reports that their hearts shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Judah had seen war before. They had been in war and had experienced the bitter realities of war. In their time of terror, God spoke to Isaiah and told him to take his son and meet up with King Ahaz. Isaiah's son was named Shear Jashub, which means a remnant will return. We'll come back to this later. Isaiah presented himself together with his son before Ahaz and said, The plans of Aram and Israel against Judah will not stand. It will not come to pass. If you need a proof, ask the Lord for a sign, whether in the deepest depth or in the highest heights. Ahaz replied to Isaiah, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now this response may sound pious and humble to our ears, but remember Ahaz was the most unfaithful, doing the opposite of what God wanted. If you listen carefully to their conversation, Ahaz arrogantly says, don't bother me with your God, Isaiah. I'm not wasting my time with you. I have important things to do. I need to call people in high places in Assyria. Ahaz's pride and arrogance is felt in Isaiah's response. Isaiah replied, Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And he goes on prophesying about the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The wicked king Ahaz heard about the Messiah, the God King. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. This is in Isaiah chapter 7 verses 13 to 17. The next thing Ahaz did was to send presents to Assyria saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and deliver me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel who are rising up against me. It was easier for Ahaz to appeal to Assyria than the global empire for military aid than to rely on the prophetic promises of God. It was easier to rely on weapons than to stand firm in his faith on God. It was easier to surrender himself as a son and servant to the king of Assyria than to be the son and servant of the most powerful God. Such was the nature of Ahaz, who entirely rearranged, mixed and mingled, defiled the temple of the Lord, and finally shut the doors of the temple, bringing the functionality of priests and the Levites to a complete halt. Now, does this sound familiar? How often have we mixed and mingled, defiled the things of God because we relied on human power? because we want to please the people. In doing so, have we not shut the doors on God and turned our face away from Him and turned our backs on Him? Do we wonder why God is not present in our style of leadership? Let's take time to silently reflect on this. As the temple doors closed, the word of the Lord came both to Isaiah and Micah and they prophesied about the mountain of the Lord. Mountain is a metaphor used in the Bible for governance. In the last days, 
the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Five generations later, since this prophecy, the house of Judah ended up in Babylon. Another 14 generations later, Emmanuel, a sign prophesied by Isaiah, was born during the Roman Empire. The Assyrian and Babylonian world empires were forsaken just like in the prophecy. They were no more. So Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, came. Along with him, he brought his kingship and his kingdom. He preached about it. He demonstrated it. And you know what? We didn't get it. Just like Hezekiah, we do what we know to do. Reopen the church doors. We continue building Christian gathering places and perform synagogue-style church services, something Jesus never preached or taught. We offer sacrifices of praise. We build prayer altars. We read the scriptures and explain to the crowd what we have understood. We sing songs. We play instruments. We invite excellent orators to speak, we collect money, and we ask God to bless our boring routines, and we go home. We repeat this again next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. We have reduced Emmanuel, of whom Isaiah prophesied God with us, God who wants to dwell amongst us, to a mere visitor of 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. The rest of the week, Emmanuel doesn't dwell in our midst. Next Sunday morning, we reopen the church doors again. It must be disgusting to God like it was in the days of Ahaz. Isaiah describes God's agony like this in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 to 15. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of them. Weary basically means a mental and emotional exhaustion. We exhaust God mentally and emotionally by deeds we think are pleasing to God. Sorry to say, but our deeds of service to God invokes the opposite reaction in him. Are we listening? God is not pleased with us. He is exhausted because of the stuff we do for him on behalf of him. Amos picks up a similar agonized tone of God and says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. You find this in Amos chapter 5 verses 21 to 23. This kind of worship we do keeps God shut out of our fellowship. And we wonder why we experience so little of God in our midst. As if God couldn't say it louder, the corona pandemic shut down the doors of our churches and gatherings. Do we at least hear him now? No, we behave just like Hezekiah and reopen our church services. Reopening the temple door stimulated the people to continue the old ways of worship that were weary and stenchful to God, as their prophets declared. Did reopening the temple doors keep God's people in the promised land? Again, no. Just four generations after Hezekiah, they ended up in Babylon as captives, far away from their homeland. Friends, we can shut and reopen our church doors as many times as we want. 
As long as we don't enter into the governance of Jesus Christ, we may end up in Babylon, homeless. And as long as we are homeless, we cannot expect Emmanuel to live amongst us. Human-built churches limit, if not prevent, God's people from entering and living in the country of God, which is His kingdom. We can pray all what we want for revival in our churches. Revival is not in Jesus' agenda. It's a human agenda. Revival is nothing but a temporary spike of spiritual adrenaline. Then it fades away. It's very similar to opening and shutting our church door. It comes and goes, doesn't remain to dwell. 2,000 years ago, Jesus preached that the kingdom of God has come. Not once did he preach that revival has come. Why then do we waste so much time, money, energy, prayers on something that Jesus didn't say he would do? Send revival. He came to establish his kingship as in heaven, so on earth, and he invites us to dwell in his kingdom, under his rule. He came to build his governance as in heaven, so on earth, and the gates of hates will not prevail against it. It will retreat and recede. Such is the active ruling domain of God. Do our human-made churches represent this ruling domain of God on earth, or do we continue our well-pre-planned program next Sunday? It is time, therefore, to consecrate. Okay, here is a sounding call of a trumpet, clearly blowing if you could hear, summoning the elders and those in the service of God to consecrate, separate oneself for the bidding of the king. Consecrate, not because you are chosen, special, called out, anointed, majestic or holy, no. Consecrate because of the urgency in the cause of the king and his kingship. Hezekiah did what he knew best in his time. He repaired and renovated the building. See, Emmanuel wasn't born yet in his days. In spite of repairs and renovations and restorations of the old traditions, Hezekiah did not end well. In our times, we see church buildings repaired and renovated with new paint, brighter and more colorful lights with smoke machines, hip music and swag singers. Jesus is weary of such. It stinks in his nostrils, a defilement, a stain that needs to be removed. Jesus does not accept human building his church. I will build my ecclesia, my governance, said Jesus. The ecclesia he builds does not look like the churches we build. So let's stop building our own polluted, impure versions of churches online and offline. 2,000 years ago, Jesus preached that the kingdom of God has come. But we tend to go. Going to church is easier to do than to live under the rulership of our King Jesus Christ. Church services are easy hideouts from being the city on a hill which is visible. The bigger the crowd, the easier the chance to escape and hide. 90 minutes of fellowship is easily doable from living 24-7 in communities of the kingdom where Jesus is the head and not any other human leader. We need to align to his kingship. We are to align vertically as in heaven, so on earth. But very much like the people of the world, we tend to align horizontally, as in America, so on earth, as in Hillsong, so on earth, as in our board meetings, so on earth, and as those who donate dictate, so on earth. Yes, I said it, someone has to say it, right? Christians and churches seem to be racing from one fad to the other fad, made in earth. We find it easier to take refuge in the kingdoms of this earth than to rely on the kingship of Jesus Christ. Just like Ahaz, who relied on the Assyrian army because he couldn't put his faith in God, we easily come to terms with the name and fame, power and status of this world and discard the orders of our king, his commands, his values, and his standards. 
reliance on earthly powers, structures, and support means denial of God's existence. Let that deeply sink within us. Therefore, consecrate. Separate yourself from the affairs of this world and align to kingdom standards. Emmanuel, God with us on earth as in heaven, is a 24-7 lifestyle. We cannot afford to have Emmanuel, God with us, just for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning event and then be God without us until next Sunday event when we sing, Jesus, you are welcome in our midst, like hypocrites. Jesus the King wants us to separate from everything that separates us from Him. We experienced our church doors being shut down for two years now. Does it not remind us of the times of Ahaz's reign? We building our churches the way we like it? Would God watch it and do nothing about it? Think. God sent Isaiah and Micah during those days to tell Ahaz about Emmanuel establishing his kingdom to dwell among his people. When our church doors shut down, what did we hear the King of Kings say? And when the church doors reopen, like when Hezekiah reopened the temple doors, are we going back doing the same things that we already know to do and stink and exhaust God in the process? Therefore, consecrate. Not because the church doors are reopened. No, Jesus the King is extending his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He's extending his dwelling as in heaven, so on earth, where he is the man of his house, our head. All our leadership has to come under his headship. When Isaiah went to meet King Ahaz, he took his son along with him. His son is called Shear Jashub, meaning a remnant will return. Since the past few years, a large number of people both young and old are steadily moving out of churchy Christianity and shutting the door behind. They are not running away from God. They are running away because they did not find what Jesus came preaching in their churches. For 2,000 years, God's kingdom, His domain, has been weathering out the storms and the rains of churchianity and the religion of Christianity, where mere human beings are building and maintaining it. The good news is that as the churches close down and decline, the mountain of the Lord, His kingship, and His domain rises steadily. Micah and Isaiah prophesied about 3,000 years ago that in the last days the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Aren't we in the most exciting days? The Shia Jashubs of today, the remnant, the remains, the leftovers who have weathered out churchy Christianity, are climbing a different mountain. They are the kingdom seekers. They are tracing the way back to the default kingdom foundations. They do not easily give away themselves to the traditions of their fathers or to the ways of this world. They say, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Let us come under the rule and governance of King Jesus. Let us learn of His ways, walk in His paths, and live by His laws. These are today's Shea Jashubs. They don't come as individuals. They climb as a team. Let us. They don't follow a human leader. They are directed by the King Himself. They know to function as a team under the headship of Christ. They don't control and manipulate because they have surrendered to the bidding of the king. They build on an unshakable foundation, the strong foundation that remains unchanged in the midst of all the shakings. A remnant will return. This is happening right now as we speak. The Holy Spirit is speaking to many Shea Jashubs to leave the church and to seek His kingdom. Stop going to church and start seeking Jesus' kingdom. Those who seek, find it and enter it. A remnant that is attuned to the ways of the kingdom of God and has forsaken to embrace the ways of this world. Yes, a remnant that is in this world 
However, live a life that is not of this world, a remnant that responds to the commission of their king as in John chapter 17 verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Therefore, consecrate before you shift from church into kingdom. Consecrate, devote and dedicate for the cause of our king. Consecrate, actively be set apart beyond the norm. Consecrate, sanctify, make holy to stand and serve before a holy God. Consecrate, separate, die to self for the bidding of the king. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for listening to the end. See you soon another time.